That's right. Your eyes don't deceive you. We have a very special show today. Grant, we have a first guest on the Recruits podcast. Very excited about that. Uh, he's he's seen over 60 games of Philip Meshar in the OHL playing for Kitchener. So we have a lot of questions for him. Habs fans, you're going to want to tune in. The SIG podcast, Recruits Draftcast, starts right now. Turn up your volume. Because you're about to listen to the Sick Podcast. Sick Podcast. Recruits Draft Cast. And with the first overall selection in the 2023 NHL Draft, the Chicago Blackhawks are very proud to select from the Regina Pats, the Western Hockey League, Connor Bedard. The sickest NHL Draft and Scouting Podcast. It's going to be sick. Okay, without further ado, we bring in the U15 coach for um, Kitchener, Dan Mahar. Thank you for coming on the show, Dan, taking the time to speak with us. Uh, Dan, Habs fans should be really excited about you coming on because you got to see Habs prospect Philip Mashar play over 60 games in Kitchener last season. And you wrote a fantastic piece for recruits. Now, we won't divulge all that information, right? If you're watching and you want to hear more about that, you have to go to recruits.ca and, and subscribe uh, to that. But Dan, uh, quickly, I mean, Philip Machar is likely heading to Laval next season. Um, give us your thoughts. Like, how do you think he'll fit in? Is he ready f to make the jump to pro? Um, what, what do you think? What do you expect out of Machar next season? Yeah, thanks, Shane. No, I would have uh, preferred him having another year in junior based on what I saw last year. But given okay. all the circumstances that he didn't get great development last year, repetitive mistakes I, i'm excited to see the opportunity to have pro coaching pro level coaching some development staff from the the habs on hand to to uh, for some oversight i think that's what was missing last year in kitchener in general just some accountability some tweaking mm -hmm. some adjustment there wasn't much development so while i think his tool set right now his his decision making his maturity is not at the ahl level yet the dis development curve is clearly going to be steeper working there than it was in Kitchener. Okay. okay. Hey, hey, Dan, glad you could uh, come on there. Um, Dan, a couple of years ago, uh, Shane, I don't know if you know, but he, um, he wrote game summaries for, for recruits on, uh, on our website and they were, they were just fabulous. You could tell that he had a background and a coaching background. So uh, he has a flowery way of describing uh, prospects better than I do. Uh, I tend to be a bit, you know, skates good type. You know, <laughs> and uh, he, he, he's, uh, he's great at describing a prospect. So I would recommend anybody that uh, wants the low down on, on Mashar and what he needs yep. to do and what he does well to uh, have a look at that article. Cause it's great. Um, I, I just, um, one thing I was wondering, like I heard through the grapevine that, uh, that he put on 15 pounds this this summer now one of the things you mentioned in the uh, article was that you thought he lost a lot of puck battles um hopefully it doesn't it didn't slow him down but do you think that uh with, with 15 pounds of muscle that he'll be able you know that he'll be able to adjust the ahl yeah yeah no i think that's a great point like obviously love to see him bulk up a little the muscle the musculature especially the upper body was an issue for sure i think more than anything though it's learning how to use that weight in in the way he positions himself on the ice because you could tell from his season in in the ohl that he wasn't used to needing to defend himself with his body as much he came from a league where clearly his skating helped him escape helped him buy buy ice time well, he's at a level now where all the players attack you when you lose speed. So when you turn, when you stop, they're trained to come at you. And that's where you need the leverage, the upper body, the lower body. And that's what he really had trouble with. Because you could tell after his first few really successful games, once the league started to see what he was all about, what his tendencies were, and started to do video work, they learned to pounce the second he, he decelerated. And then, of course, he's getting rubbed off really easily and not understanding quite how to position his body. So if he did get rubbed off, he could recover the puck. So I think all those things will adding the weight will definitely help there. But just having those coaches show him on video and figure out how to position his body, how to keep his speed up so that players are, have to respect that rather than just attack as soon as he loses it. But I think all of those things are pieces of his puzzle. Oh, that's interesting. I, I, I know he played... Uh 
or you saw at least 60 of his games. I probably saw 20 or so. Um, in the article, you touch on Adam Dennis maybe not uh, being a best mentor for him. But they did, Mike McKenzie, you know, Bob's son, did come in. He's a GM and he took over. And if there's one thing in the, in the article that I maybe ha- had a little bit of dispute with, because I saw quite a f- few of his playoff games, was that I thought he did play better uh, with, with the changing in coaching. Would you agree with that? Oh, for sure. Yeah. And and maybe I didn't state that properly in the article. I think he he didn't improve as much as some of his teammates once McKenzie took over, but everyone on that roster improved, especially if nothing else, the work rate. The work rate was a much higher once Mike McKenzie took over that bench. Yeah. We, uh, we actually, yeah, we have some video to show yeah. actually uh, about Me- for Meshar uh, against Windsor, right? I think this was game two, Grant. Yeah. This is, a, you know, I saw this game and, um, this to me was a. He didn't get a lot of points in 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 the playoffs, but this game alone, which uh, which I happened to see, I thought that he probably should have had three or four assists. You know, he was he yeah. was driving the play. He was, and I thought he he drove the play really well throughout the playoffs. Um, Again, you know, he doesn't uh, always make the right decision when he does cross the line, as you mentioned in the uh, in the article. But in this game, especially, I just uh, I thought that it, it was an example. And I talked to Mike McKenzie about it after the season, where he probably should have had more points in the playoffs than he got, and it wasn't necessarily his fault because he, as you'll see here, he he set up guys. You know, how many chances? Uh, there was probably seven or eight chances that he created in that game. So, you know, if he can bring that to um, to the AHL level this year, there's another. I mean, that was a perfect pass. So that game, you know, it, I always say that you like to see the best of a player in a game. And for me, that that showed you the potential that he does have and that if he can, can play it, like this uh, more consistent again look like how many how many assists could he have had in that game and he got no points so uh for yeah. me i was more yeah. impressed with his playoff and i hope that he can just build off that this season in laval yeah and just for added context that grant you're absolutely right those clips you just showed some of that back checking that you were seeing from Mashar and their puck recovery that's yeah. what everyone wants to see from him. That's not what we were seeing in the regular season, particularly right. under Chris Dennis. That ramped up tenfold. And I think you're absolutely right. That game, game two in Windsor, was the Kitchener was a different team in the playoffs for sure in that series. The Kitchener yeah. looked like they should have been on paper. Um, but Mashar was a the encouraging thing for Habs fans is like you said, twofold. One, he steps up in the big games and playoffs. We saw that in the world juniors as well. And two, you saw the opportunities he creates for teammates. Mm-hmm. Like you said, he could have had four assists just in those clips you showed. So he is creating. He is gaining opportunities for his teammates. He is doing all those things that we saw when we wanted to see when we drafted him. So there's a lot to be uh, encouraged by here. I think it's just those bad habits. And if he back checks like you saw in those clips consistently, which he will under pro coaching or he won't play, he's going to be fine. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And funny enough, the Kitchener Rangers were eliminated by the London Knights in the playoffs. And who happened to be a defenseman on the London Knights? His future teammate, Logan Mayu. So you got a chance to see Logan play. Um, Grant and I saw him at the development camp for the Habs and he blew us away. Like he was a bully on the ice. He really was. Um, how, How did you appreciate his game? Do you think he'll translate well to the AHL this season? Yeah, I think the AHL is a perfect place for Logan Mayu. He's obviously got the frame for it right now. He's got the skating for it. His shot is un- unbelievable. Uh, and the way he gains space for himself is underrated as well. You see that big frame with a relatively mm-hmm. smooth skater, and you think, well, he he looks like he's lumbering through the neutral zone. But then you look at his opponents, and they're, they're wheeling to try and catch him. So he's That's just it. got that ability, that natural ability to gain space. And with Logan Mayu, it's always going to be, uh, how does he develop on the decision-making end? And you saw you said you described him as a bully yet he's got that physical frame where he will punish players he's just got to know when to pick his spots not take himself yeah. out of position and more importantly get back into position because you're right look at that london kitchener series and and even the next one for london 
he can dominate. He's a man amongst boys in junior when he wants to be. It's just those little mm -hmm. brain lapses he has to control, which is what he'll start to do in the AHL, hopefully. Well, he, uh, you know, he played less than 100 games at the OHL level. And, he, you know, I, I think that the difference that we saw at the end of uh, two years ago and then uh, playing 28 minutes a night in the playoffs for uh, for London, the difference that we saw defensively is encouraging. And if we can see another similar improvement over the next year, uh, do you think, do you think, can you see him uh, getting some games with the Habs maybe at the end of the year if they, if they trade Savard perhaps? I, I can. Yeah. Because if you look at someone like Justin Barron, who had some of the similar brain cramps in his game, but acquitted himself fairly well at, at the NHL level towards the end of the year, I don't see a whole lot of difference in terms of the projection for Mayu right now. Um, I, I think with Mayu, there's some sloppiness in his game and some bad habits that I think once he consistently, consistently cleans those up, realizes he's got a massive frame. He's a good skater. He's got huge reach simply by body positioning. He's going to be able to snuff a lot of the plays that he was relinquishing in the OHL as he matured. And like you said, Grant, it got better and better throughout the year as he got games under his belt. So I think the sky's the limit for Logan Mayu, and it's just a, a question of getting the reps in. Um, how, I don't know how often you got to see Owen Beck last year, but obviously he, uh, uh, he it, it was an up and down season for him. He got traded, he got traded, and the uh, the points seemed to dry up for him. But ended up winning an OHL title, and I think maybe it was good for his overall growth as a as a pro later that you know he he didn't get asked to play a scoring role. Uh, he he got asked to play a a two way role a, and to do everything for for Peterborough, and they ended up winning a title. So how do you think last season will bode for his? Uh, pro future as far as his development goes. Yeah, I think Owen, Owen Beck obviously plays a really responsible 200-foot game, and I think he's a coach's dream in that sense. Uh, great on face-offs, can put him in all situations with virtually anyone on the roster. I think we saw that offensive production flatline or maybe even dip a bit after the trade, and there's lots of reasons for that. Wasn't being asked to do as much offensively in Peterborough, adjustment to the new uh, team, et cetera, et cetera. But I think going back, the question is always going to be that offensive ceiling. I think right now he could probably step in and play a fourth line role, 200 foot game for Montreal, not look terribly out of place with his skating and his IQ and positioning. Uh, it's just how much can we milk out of that offensive game? And we know he's got that wrist shot. We know he's got a bit of a tendency to cut across the middle and throw it back across his body. Doesn't always work as well in the NHL and AHL, or at least if you do it, you darn well better keep your head up or open up your options with your teammates. So I think those are things that he's going to need to work on. Uh, because right now, is he a 30-point player in the NHL, or can we milk a 60-point player there? That's that's what has to be determined, I think. Awesome. Awesome. Dar Grant, did you have anything else? No, that's good. Great. Well, thank you, Dan. Pre really appreciate it. <laughs> Thanks, Shane. Appreciate it. Sorry for my technical troubles early. No no worries. Thanks, Dan. <laughs> that's it. Thanks, Grant. That's appreciate it. it. Yeah, for sure. So that was Dan Mahar. We'll hopefully have him on again. Lots of interesting things to talk about. Um, and Grant, we'll be back. You and I, Monday, we're recording. Tuesday, we're uploading. Stay tuned, folks. Yeah. This is the SIG Podcast Recruits Draftcast. See you then. And that's a wrap. Hope you don't miss us too much until next time. Follow the SIG Podcast Recruits Draftcast on YouTube, Facebook, Google Play, and Apple Podcasts.